Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming from right here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Courtney Friedman. Coming up, the state's stay at home orders expired tonight. We'll explain what that means here in San Antonio, where City Council approved a new stay home work safe order just today. We'll talk about the new goals for the Bear County Collaborative Commission on Domestic Violence amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Plus, a local emergency room doctor will join us live to answer your questions about the coronavirus. But first, 48 additional COVID-19 cases confirmed in Bear County tonight. That brings the total number of cases to 1,374. Two additional cases have been reported. Two additional deaths, rather, have been reported, bringing that total to 48. 689 people are still fighting the virus tonight. 638, though, have recovered. Local leaders attribute the jump in cases from yesterday to more widespread testing at the Bear County Jail, where, the, where there are now 129 inmates with confirmed cases. Not all of the confirmed cases were included in today's count, but moving forward, the city says they will begin tracking cases at the jail differently. Starting tomorrow, going to break those out so that we can track and y'all can see of our total cases, how many of those are associated with the universal testing that we're doing in the jail. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says more than 300 inmates and deputies have now been tested. We have been bringing you results from our latest Bear Facts KSAT Rivard report poll. When asked about the severity of specific issues plaguing our area, people ranked both child abuse and domestic violence in the top five. Last year, I brought you a story about Bear County's first ever court ordered collaborative commission on domestic violence. After the release of these poll results, I reached back out to several commission leaders to see what gaps they found and what progress they've made. Actions are preceded by attitudes. It all begins with an acknowledgement that we have a problem. Family Violence Prevention Services CEO Marta Palaya is encouraged by the fact that our community is admitting child abuse and domestic violence are rampant. That realization led to our region's first ever formal county city collaborative commission on domestic violence formed about a year ago. We have the leaders of every organization that is addressing the issue of domestic violence sitting at a table, having this conversation together. One of the commission's leaders, Judge Monique Diaz, says there are now eight committees setting goals and meeting monthly. The judiciary, law enforcement, prosecution, nonprofit, health care, data, education, and faith-based. Every committee identifies gaps and sets strategies to fill them. Diaz lists a few already under the microscope. The issue of the surrender of firearms that are in the possession of individuals who are court ordered to not possess them, subject to protective orders or mental health orders. We are proud to announce that we've actually already attained funding to develop a domestic violence high risk team that is being housed at the Bear County Family Justice Center. That team will flag the high risk cases that could end in death and offer wraparound services to that victim. In the nonprofit committee, uh, we're looking at um, bringing in pro bono legal services. We're looking at providing domestic violence programming in the schools for elementary levels. The commission also setting new goals amid the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, using the COVID-19 hotline to offer resources. We review with every caller the opportunities to get help around domestic violence and child abuse. Not necessarily because that caller might be the person who needs those services, but we're asking them to check on family and friends. Jenny Hickson with Metro Health's domestic violence team has helped create flyers for school districts and the food bank to include when distributing food boxes. Domestic violence resources, but also parenting tips. We know that times of economic stress, when things like this are going on, that makes it harder for sometimes parenting relationships to go well if they're already a little rocky. High stress while stuck at home together can be a recipe for domestic violence, keeping advocates and experts busier than ever. Now, this story is part of my series confronting domestic violence called Loving and Fear. If you can find more of those stories, you want to see them along with domestic violence resources. We have all of that at ksat.com slash domestic violence. In just a few hours, Texas Governor Greg Abbott's stay at home orders will expire and the state will enter the first phase of the governor's plan to reopen the Texas economy. Meanwhile, the city of San Antonio voted today to approve a new stay home work safe order. So what do these seemingly contradictory actions mean for you and me? RJ Marquez explains the situation. <laughs> 
Governor Greg Abbott's executive stay-at-home order will expire tonight, allowing some businesses to reopen tomorrow with limited capacity. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf have revised local stay-at-home work-safe orders to stay consistent with the state. Both local and state orders are in effect through May 19th. In Bear County, gatherings are still prohibited beyond your household, and social distancing is still required in shared outdoor spaces and inside stores. People who violate the rules risk facing fines and possible jail time. Local residents must also continue wearing face coverings in places where social distancing is difficult, like in grocery stores or pharmacies. But this is the major difference from the state's order, which supersedes local orders. The state says residents cannot be arrested or fined for not wearing face coverings, but privately owned businesses can ask customers to leave if they are not wearing a mask. When it comes to reopening businesses, Abbott says all Texas retail stores, restaurants, movie theaters, and malls are allowed to open Friday as long as they operate at 25% occupancy and follow social distancing guidelines. Gyms, bars, barbershops, nail salons, and public swimming pools all have to stay closed for now. Dentists and other licensed healthcare professionals can resume services. Museums and libraries can reopen, but interactive exhibits have to stay closed. Abbott also says churches could expand occupancy and that sports like tennis or golf can resume as long as there are not more than four people playing together. This does not mean that businesses have to reopen and some have already said they do not plan on doing so immediately. There are also concerns from local health officials that Governor Abbott's plan to reopen Texas is premature for San Antonio. There are places in Texas that have hardly seen any cases where the population density is very low. And I think resuming business is probably a very good idea and important for those places. San Antonio is different. We have a higher population density and we're worried that this may be early. Despite these concerns, the state is moving ahead with the first phase. The second phase would begin in mid-May if the state is able to maintain healthcare capacity and limit the spread or new flare-up of COVID-19. For The Nine, RJ Marcus. Coming up a little later in the newscast, we'll hear from a local restaurant owner preparing to reopen tomorrow about the safety measures he's taking. Zooming out now, there are more than 1 million COVID-19 cases in the United States and more than 63,000 deaths. Globally, there are more than 3.2 million cases and 233,000 deaths. Turning now to tonight's 9 at 9, a deadly fire in South Korea. Police investigating a shooting at the Cuban embassy in Washington, now saying it's a suspected hate crime. Plus, a look at how COVID-19 is impacting communities across the world. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. Police in Kentucky say at least four children from an Amish family are dead after an accident involving their horse and carriage on Wednesday. One person survived and one child is still missing. Police say the family was trying to cross a low-lying stream in their carriage. As they started into the water, they noticed that it was getting deeper than what they thought. As they tried to back the buggy up, the horse lost its footing, causing it to go into the water and overturn the buggy. Two witnesses were able to rescue the horse. Here at home, a Bear County Sheriff's deputy who was tested for COVID-19 two days ago died this morning. Detention officer Timothy De La Fuente was a 27-year veteran with the Sheriff's Office. Health officials confirmed that Deputy De La Fuente had tested positive for COVID-19 this morning before they could even notify him. His wife had found him dead inside their north side home. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the deputy had underlying health conditions. He also says he expects cases will skyrocket now that there is widespread testing inside the jail. In South Korea, investigators are investigating a construction site fire that killed at least 38 people and injured several others. An arrest has been made after a shooting at Cuba's embassy in Washington, D.C. There was damage to the building, but no injuries were reported. A restaurant on the northeast side struggling like many to keep its doors open during the coronavirus pandemic having to deal with another more aggressive problem. 225 urban smoke was closed today because burglars cleaned them out overnight. They were robbed of thousands of dollars worth of brisket, ribs, chicken, turkey, and catfish. We're not a Bill Miller's, we're not a Rudy's. You know, we don't, we don't have that type of buying power and we don't have that type of reserve. You know what I mean? Like, um, I'm just like everybody else, man. It's just like we punch the clock. And we here every day, 11 to six and you know, I lost a whole day and the whole weekends of supply. Urban smoke will be opened again tomorrow. The owners hope surveillance video will help police catch the thieves. A surfer in California injured after an encounter with a shark. 
The man was in about eight feet of water when the shark aggressively bumped him. Right now, red tides are occurring off the coast, and that makes it harder to see in the water. A biologist says it's possible the shark thought the surfer was a seal. It's possible that the reduced visibility in the water, that brown that people see during the day, um, made, made it easier for the shark to make a mistake. The surfer's injuries were minor. For the past six weeks, local coffee house Folklores has delivered grocery items to nearly 4,000 senior citizens across San Antonio, and they don't plan to stop anytime soon. To us, it feels like we're doing the right thing. You know, um, we feel like this was our calling, and we haven't stopped, and we've been doing at it for a long time, and a lot of, friend, a lot of our friends believe what we're doing, and uh, they help us out, you know, so, you know, we're blessed. Up to 250 care packages get delivered every two days. They include a pound of rice, beans, pasta, and vegetables. Take a look at NASA's new space helicopter. It now has a name thanks to an Alabama teenager. Vanessa Rupani suggested the name Ingenuity during NASA's Name the Rover essay contest. Rupani wrote, Ingenuity is what allows people to accomplish amazing things, and it allows us to expand our horizons to the edges of the universe, end quote. Ingenuity will go to Mars, attached to the Perseverance rover this summer. NASA says it will be the first aircraft to attempt powered flight on another planet. A British World War II veteran who raised millions for the UK's health service by walking laps around his garden, now celebrating his 100th birthday. Tom Moore, who rose to the rank of captain during his military career, was also promoted to colonel in recognition of his fundraising efforts. Moore thanked his supporters on social media. He also received more than 125,000 birthday cards from his fans. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Good evening, I'm meteorologist Katie Blake. Let's get you ready for your Friday in the upcoming weekend. And I have some good news. Friday is gonna be another nice day, sunny, and warm, yes, but Friday is really gonna be our last day where humidity will be on the lower side for everyone because this weekend, it'll start to feel more muggy again, especially by Sunday. And most of next week, looks like it's gonna feel a lot like summer here as we get into early May, hot and humid days ahead. So with that being said, enjoy tonight. It's going to be another comfortable night with temperatures falling down into the 50s under clear skies. On your Friday, just like today, we're gonna to heat up very quickly. So from the 50s early in the morning to the low 90s in the afternoon, a few high thin cirrus clouds here or there. And you'll also notice the breeze a bit more tomorrow as compared to today. Also different tomorrow as compared to today is the air quality. The air quality will not be as good on Friday as it was today because of higher levels of ozone in the air. And that means that the air quality will be considered unhealthy for sensitive groups. Who are those groups? Will they include people with respiratory conditions like asthma, also the elderly and the very young? You may also have some additional questions about this air quality issue, including how can ozone be higher if there have been less cars on the road during COVID-19? I answered that question for you and a couple more. You can check it out on ksat.com. There's a whole article all about it. You can find it on the homepage, so check that out on ksat.com. So just keep in mind tomorrow, air quality will not be the greatest. And if you fall into one of those sensitive groups, please limit your time outdoors. Also to consider tomorrow afternoon if you want to get out for a run or a jog. The afternoon hours just won't be as great because it is going to start to get pretty hot out there tomorrow. But as we get into the early and middle part of next week, the heat really cranks up. High temperatures, mid to upper 90s with very muggy air in place. So I think as we get into early next week, we have to start talking about a heat index or those feels like temperatures, what it feels like to our bodies, because those numbers could really start to creep up as we get into early next week. We are eyeing a front that should arrive before Wednesday to help bring our temperatures back down into the mid 80s in the afternoons and that front could also spark a couple of showers and storms. Those rain chances are still a bit in question as of now, but we'll keep you updated. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Katie. We'll be back in just one minute. Steve Spreis here will be talking to a local ER doctor. Stay with us. It is the unknown and a lot of us have questions and separating facts from fiction surrounding this pandemic 
is why we are continuing this portion of the show where we bring viewer questions about COVID-19 to some of our local experts. And tonight we're once again speaking with Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, an emergency room doctor working right here in San Antonio at Methodist Hospital. Doctor, as always, thank you for joining us. What are you seeing in the emergency room lately? So the last week has been pretty encouraging. We're still seeing, a, you know, a few cases, uh, new cases being admitted, um, but we're seeing much more patients recover, more, many more patients recover and be discharged home. So the overall number of patients with COVID in Methodist Hospital right now is is uh, very low. It's at only 15 patients. And I just want to uh, make sure everyone understands those patients are in a separate area of the hospital and they're cared for by a separate team of of nurses and techs and doctors that don't move from patient to patient. So you're safe coming into the emergency department. And that's what I want to talk, expand on that a little bit, because since we really first started talking, you were concerned that you're not seeing some of the normal cases, the non COVID related cases that you usually see in the ER. Uh, that's that's very true. And it's and it's concerning. And just as an example, the, in a nor we're a comprehensive stroke center. That means we have treat, uh, many treatments available for strokes. One of those treatments is a uh, medication to possibly dissolve a clot that is that is uh, causing a stroke. In a normal month, we would administer that ma medication between 10 and 15 times. In all of April, we only administered it five times. And and what I'm fearful of is that's ten, five to 10 patients who sat at home, came in too late in order to get that medication that might improve their outcomes. So. And, that, and that's why it's so important to get the message out there that the ER and the hospitals are safe. Correct. Yeah. Correct. All right. First question we have tonight, what are some of the new symptoms of COVID-19 uh, that have been spelled out? Yeah, so I think the CDC added, added some symptoms um, for people to look at, uh, and most of them are really just those symptoms that we would normally associate with any um, viral illness, headache, sore throat, chills, recurrent chills. Um, and those are pretty common, sore throat, are pretty common with really any viral illness. And I, and I wanna remind people that it's not just one of those, it's a combination of those and they have to kind of present in the, in the correct way to be worrisome for COVID. If you just have a headache, that's not really very worrisome for COVID without some of the other symptoms. Kind of one of the interesting symptoms that they added, uh, which does seem to be fairly unique to COVID, is this loss of taste or smell. And uh, I haven't personally seen any patients with it, but I know my colleagues have, and uh, it's a pretty profound symptom. So it's not a subtle thing. So don't get worried if you just feel like your food tastes a little funny. Yeah, you're going to know it. Yeah. Yes. Is there any evidence, the next question from our viewers, is there any evidence that COVID-19 can be transmitted by secondhand cigarette or marijuana smoke? No, that really, I'm certainly, there's no evidence of it. It doesn't even make any sense of by the way we know the disease transmitted, unless you're sharing that cigarette or um, with, with someone else, then of course there would be that risk of transmission. There's been a lot of talk at the orders that have come from the city and the county, not necessarily matching up with the reopen orders that are coming from the governor. Do you think it's too soon to open San Antonio? Well, you know, that's a diff very complicated question. Uh, from a purely clinical perspective, you know, we, we don't want to open up until the virus is all the way eliminated. But that's really not feasible. That's like like saying that, you know, there's 6,000 deaths on the highway every year in Texas because of motor vehicle crashes. Let's not drive cars. I mean, you know, that's just not realistic. And so what we do have to do is to put safety practices in place that are akin to a seatbelt on a car to make it as safe as possible. And I know those steps are occurring. Uh, I know some of the things, the criteria to reopen are, um, are very close to being present. Um, I'm not sure they're totally present yet. Uh, for instance, the decrease in number of cases, I think we want it to be a consistently decrease for two weeks. I don't think we're quite there yet. We certainly have the hospital capacity now, uh, and I know testing and the ability to trace people is is definitely ramping up. So I think, I think we're pretty close um, from the clinical standpoint. There's a whole host of other factors that go into it that, that 
um, you know, our, we have to trust our leaders um, to do the right thing. Absolutely. All right. Next question. I'm noticing a lot of people wearing masks on either their mouth or their nose, but not always both. Do both have to be covered to work? Uh, yeah, you really need to cover both. Uh, the idea behind a mask is to prevent spreading of droplets of saliva, uh, and those droplets can come from your nose or your mouth. So really, yes, they both need to be covered. How many tests is your ER performing daily? And I know you don't know all of them, but let's say in a normal shift for you and your colleagues, how many COVID-19 tests are you usually performing? So, so currently, we are still really only testing people that um, we are suspicious might have the disease and need to be admitted to the hospital or are going to undergo a procedure or an operation. Uh, and still, so still that probably leads maybe to a dozen tests per day uh, per facility. Are you get, do you anticipate there'll be some changes in visitation or some ways that the hospital operates now that uh, the reopening of Texas has be, will begin tomorrow? Uh, I, d I do think there'll be some changes. I know that uh, some of those have already occurred with the reopening of uh, some surgical cases. I know many of those patients are allowed to have a visitor um, during that surgery. And I know there is are discussions amongst hospital leadership about opening up um, at least to have one visitor per patient. Um, that's not yet occurred yet. They're, they're planning on it. I like to do this with a lot of our experts, and uh, I want to give you the final word. What do you think our viewers need to know tonight? Um, you know, I think uh, that, I, again, I want to thank the community for, uh, for all their efforts. Um, this has not been nearly as bad as we had hoped or, or that we anticipated. Um, and I, what we hope is that there won't be a bigger second wave coming. Um, and so the way to make that happen is continue to be prudent. Um, even after things open up, that doesn't mean things are back to normal. We're still going to need to take the precautions uh, that we've all learned over the last uh, several, we many weeks. Dr. Robert Frockstein, as always, I appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. Tonight, the San Antonio Spurs are selling a minority stake in the team. That's according to a report in Variety. That report says the team has hired Guggenheim Partners to manage the process. The Spurs have a number of minority owners, but team ownership is controlled by the Holt family. Current chairman for Spurs Sports and Entertainment, Peter J. Holt, issued a statement in response to the report saying, in part, the team is 100% committed to the city of San Antonio and the Alamo City will remain the home for the Spurs. Earlier this month, the Food and Drug Administration announced they would loosen restrictions for blood donations, which previously put restrictions on gay and bisexual men. But LGBTQ advocates say the new policy is still discriminatory. The new policy says LGBTQ members who have had sexual intercourse must now wait three months before they can donate. Previously, it was 12 months. The FDA modified restrictions in an effort to increase the number of donations during the COVID-19 pandemic. LGBTQ folks are being denied those types of opportunities um, simply for being, uh, you know, their authentic self. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center say they will focus on expanding the donor bases under the new FDA guidelines once they're able to assist patients in hospitals who are receiving plasma donations. Turning to tonight's top stories, millions more Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week. The U.S. Department of Labor says first-time claims for unemployment benefits 
totaled 3.8 million in the week ending April 25th. That brings the total number of first time claims to 30.3 million over the past six weeks. Here at home, HEB is adding meat to the list of items with purchase limits. This news comes as meat packing plants across the country have closed due to COVID-19 outbreaks, causing some concerns about the supply chain. For now, shoppers will only be able to buy one package of ground beef and two total packages of any combination of either beef, chicken, pork, or turkey. VIA is extending its fare relief period through Sunday, May 17th. Safety measures will continue, meaning VIA employees will continue to have their temperatures checked, and all passengers older than 10 years old will be required to wear face coverings on board. No more than 16 passengers will be allowed on board at a time. As we mentioned earlier in the show, Texas restaurants and retailers will be allowed to reopen in a limited capacity. Occupancy has to be at 25% or below normal limits, and social distancing guidelines must still be observed. La Gloria is one of the local restaurants that will be reopening tomorrow. Chef Johnny Hernandez says preparing to open has been costly. Along with the 25% occupancy limit, there are other rules. Among those, only six people will be allowed at a table, and parties will be seated at least six feet from each other. Here at the restaurant, obviously there's been a lot of uh, thought and attention to signage, spacing. We have uh, the disposable menus that we've already written for food and for beverages. We have all the single use, uh, you know, condiments, salt, peppers, you know, so all those little things that add up to safe practices in terms of the spread of the virus. Still Hernandez says he's excited to welcome guests back. Both La Gloria locations will reopen tomorrow, along with his other restaurant, La Fruteria. We have more information about businesses that are opening tomorrow. Check it out right now on KSAT.com. Of course, some local health experts have said reopening San Antonio businesses right now may be a bit premature. This has led to concern among some workers who don't quite feel comfortable going back to work just yet. To address those concerns, Governor Greg Abbott announced the Texas Workforce Commission has issued new guidance to unemployment claimants concerned about their eligibility for benefits should they choose not to return to work right away. Under this new guidance, Texans can continue to receive unemployment benefits through the COVID-19 response if they don't return to work for one of the following reasons. If they are 65 or older, if they have a household member who is 65 or older, if the claimant has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or they have a family member with COVID-19, Texans can also continue to receive unemployment if they are under a two week quarantine due to close contact exposure to the virus or if the individual is having trouble finding someone to care for their children. For more than 50 years, the School of Nursing at UT Health San Antonio has been helping our community. Tonight, Tiffany Huertas takes a look back at the school's legacy and gives us a glimpse of what's to come. It's this week's Throwback Thursday. faculty looked like. We were very hippie back then. Endowed Distinguished Professor and Director at UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing, Dr. Kathleen Stevens, takes us back to the very beginning. The uh, early parts that I was here for was the opening of the doctorate in, uh, in nursing, the PhD, and a number of centers that became uh, a real driving force for our nursing science. In 1969, the 61st session of the Texas Legislature passed House Bill 75 and Companion Bill, Senate Bill 83 to establish the University of Texas Nursing School in Bear County in response to a nursing shortage. The entire impact of this school of nursing, not only locally, but at the state level in terms of you know, moving policy forward in public health has been a real joy to watch. Dean and Professor Dr. Eileen Breslin says the school continues to change. This school is proud of most recently is our Center for the Caregiver has very much got involved in advancing San Antonio being recognized as a dementia friendly city. The school hosts caregiver skills training workshops and virtual dementia tours. We have trained over 440 individuals within our community. We have also had over 1,600 community members go through our training and getting education about how do we best care for our loved ones in a skilled capacity. Dr. Breslin follows a great legacy of leaders and recognizes the importance of the school's work. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be a nurse.
We really touch people's lives at very important times in their transition, and so I think we really have an important role in ensuring that we are the patient advocates, we really focus on ethics, we really um, are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The dean says 85% of all the students come from the surrounding areas. She says they are the largest producer of baccalaureate nurses and graduate nurses in South Texas. But what do future students think? Nurses have to be adaptable. We have to be innovative. Healthcare is always changing and uh, the school helps us start that that line of thinking and understanding very early on um, by allowing us to have simulation centers and providing us really great learning opportunities that are just um, representative of the change in healthcare in terms of technology and um, evolution of what it is to be a nurse. We've been very focused on achieving excellence, focusing on preparing the best and the brightest, and also the next generation of nurse leaders for the profession and the discipline of nursing. For the Nine, Tiffany Huertas. Hey everybody, welcome back to another segment of Trending. Now I do want to address really quickly, as the state reopens back up, I have trimmed my beard to pre-quarantine lengths consistent with the medical guidelines I put on my own beard. Uh, so thank you guys so much for your support in this trying time. It's good to not be so itchy here. Uh, with that being said, let's get into the stories on KSAT.com today. The first one is about banana bread. Now, quarantine has gotten a lot of people bored and honestly, I totally understand it. I've been looking for some things to do myself and banana bread has one, been one of the most search things uh, on Google, on a lot of search traffic, uh, on a lot of search engines, excuse me. Um, so we compiled five banana bread recipes um, that are really good to try. Now you got some classic choices in there, but you also have one with coffee, cream cheese, frosting. Coffee, cream cheese, and frosting. Those are my favorite words. You put them together, of course I'm gonna try that. That sounds incredible. So look up those recipes at ksad.com. It looks delicious, what, what's there to lose? Now, if the banana bread isn't a good enough reason for you to stay inside, maybe this story will uh, help entice you a little bit more. Um, there are some creepy, crawly animals out there uh, in South Texas, San Antonio included, and we rounded them all up in a story today, uh, finding some of the most dangerous critters, uh, the ones that you should stay away from whenever you're outside uh, in San Antonio or South Texas in general. Now, whatever you're scared of, I promise you this list has an animal that will fit that mold for you. We have fire ants, you have um, scorpions, you have snakes, you have feral hogs, you have brain-eating amoeba on here. You really gotta watch out for those. That almost keeps me out of the water sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. So a list of all of those scary animals, the ones that aren't so cute, uh, you can find that on ksad.com as well. Uh, last story of the day. Oops, she did it again. Uh, Britney Spears said she accidentally burned down her home gym. She said it super nonchalant uh, in a video to her fans recently. Uh, it was really funny. She didn't really, uh, you know, say it like it was a crazy thing. She just said, you know, hey guys, it just so happens uh, I burned down my personal gym. Um, so recently she's been able to get back in it, but she wasn't able to use it for about six months, she said. What happened was she had a couple of candles, she said, and uh, one thing led to another, uh, and I guess flames broke out there. It's okay, Britney Spears. We're happy to see you back in the gym. You're exercising. That's more than I can say for myself, so that's pretty good. Uh, all that, so much more on KSAT.com. I'll see you guys. Take care of each other.
We know the world can be seemingly turned upside down when you hear all this hard news every day. So as always, we want to end your night by telling you something good. Take a look at this heartwarming parade put together for the East Central softball team seniors. Some of the girls got emotional seeing how teammates, coaches and parents made what was supposed to be their senior night game so memorable. We air these segments at the end of our 9 p.m. and weekend night beat shows. So if you want to join in, just email us a picture, video, description of a good deed, a quote, anything positive that you would like to share. Email it to something good at ksat.com. Thanks so much for watching. The night beat starts at 10. See you then.